All right, so to begin, just a big thank you to uh, the Science and Policy Exchange Group for inviting me to speak tonight. I'm, it's my pleasure to be here, and I'm delighted to see such a great turnout. Um, so now that we've been provided with such a nice kind of scientific backdrop to CRISPR, we're going to move on to looking at the ethical, legal, and social implications. So my talk will really be to kind of provide you with a lay of the land as to the regulatory landscape surrounding gene editing. So some of the objectives of my talk are first to look at the applications of CRISPR-Cas9, then to look at the social representations and public perceptions of CRISPR, followed by a brief overview of the current state of CRISPR use. So what countries um, are involved in currently using CRISPR um, at a research setting? Then we'll get to the meat of my talk, which is really what is being done at the regulatory and legislative levels and where does Canada fall into this? And then finally, I'll conclude with some updates from the human gene editing workshop that we held back in August, um, which is really the first in a series looking to um, amend the Assisted Human Reproduction Act. So when we're thinking about the applications of CRISPR and we're thinking about drawing lines, um, one of the aspects to consider are really somatic gene editing versus germline gene editing, as we've heard earlier on. So when we're talking about somatic gene editing, which are really, um, which is really gene editing that will modify a single individual's genes, we can think about curing or treating patients. So an example of this would be gene therapy. Then as we move more towards germline gene editing, which would be editing a gene um, that will have implications, it's basically that can be passed on to future generations, we can think about creating genetically healthy individuals. So removing mutations so that um, at the embryo level that will then allow a child to develop um, without a specific disease or condition. And then finally, we can think about enhancing non-medical physical and mental characteristics. So this is really where we see the, um, the idea of designer babies and this is where uh, society has a bit more issues. So, as you can see, CRISPR has really been everywhere over the last year, whether it's in newspaper articles or as the cover story in scientific journals or on blogs. So CRISPR was dubbed the science um, breakthrough of 2015, and through this what we see is we see terms like engineering the human race, editing humanity, we see eugenics popping up again, and the idea of the DNA revolu revolution. So it really is a hot and sexy topic at the time, at this moment. So, now that we've looked at, um, now that we've understood that gene editing is a hot topic, let's shift to what the public has to say. So a lot of policies say that there's a need for public engagement and getting the, the public's um, opinions on the topic. There is a, a general lack of qualitative and quantitative research assessing public's perceptions with regards to gene editing. So the three studies I'm aware of, I'll briefly present to you now. So the first um, is a US-based study uh, done by the Pew Research Center, and they really looked at American attitudes toward enhancement biotechnologies. And one of the findings I wanted to present was that half or more of the public says they would not want these enhancements. So when we look at um, the first pie chart, we see that it's really 50-50. And here we're talking about um, reducing disease risk in babies. So people seem to be um, equally for or against this. But then when we move into the whole concept of enhancement and we're looking at improving cognitive abilities or improving physical abilities, we can see that there's a shift um, away from uh, wanting to move forward with this and people are more reluctant. So another study that was conducted came out um, from an Australian team and they were looking at attitudes to human genome editing. Recruitment was done via social media. So what we can see um, based on the map is that there is a good distribution of participants across the globe and seeing as recruitment was done through social media, it's no surprise that the majority of the participants um, were between 18 and 30 and I thought it was really interesting to note that the majority um, were also male. So what did this study conclude? So this, con this study shows that when we're talking about curing or treating um, or preventing um, a genetic um, disease or a disease, we can see that people are um, for this. They're in agreement with moving forward with gene editing. Um, and this is irrespective of whether it's at the somatic level, as we can see in the treatment category, so this is in children or adults, or at the germline level, so looking at the embryo. Where we see a shift towards disagreement is really when we're talking about enhancement. 
And two predictors of opinion that I kind of wanted to flag were, one, if participants were from a high GDP country, they'll typically follow this same trend. So they'll be for treatment and gene editing for treatment and preventive purposes, but they'll be against it for enhancement. And the other is if participants had a religious affiliation, we can see that they pretty much just oppose all forms of gene editing. And so the final study uh, that came out actually a month ago um, is also from the US. And this was really uh, looking at research into gene editing. So what we can conclude is that um, participants are generally supportive of research into human gene editing. And um, now if we just go through each of the graphs, we'll see that in the first one. So participants were given uh, a vignette to read. There was one group um, that was provided the vignette without any mention of the risks of gene editing. And then the rest of the groups all had a, a sentence on the risks. And what we can see is that those who were presented the, the risk were less supportive of gene editing. And then other factors that would influence, we notice that when, it lo when we look at gender, men are more supportive of gene editing. And when looking at ethnicity and political affiliation, we notice that the African American population and the right respondents are much less supportive or uh, enthusiastic um, with regards to research um, in gene editing. So now moving on, the last uh, sort of little blurb I wanted to present was, this was a blurb that appeared in Science about a year ago, and CRISPR was dubbed a weapon of mass destruction in lines with North Korea's nuclear weapons program and the Russian cruise missiles. And so the suggestion stems from fears that CRISPR will be used to create potential, potentially harmful biological agents or products. So I thought this was an interesting little blurb that appeared in a very well-reputable journal. So now, what's the current state of CRISPR use? So as we can see, um, there are several countries that are coming to the table and getting involved in gene editing research. So the UK was the first country to approve um, a research license to edit embryos. Um, and then we also had a paper that was published by the Chinese team back in 2015, which was really the catalyst for all of these international discussions. And so what we're getting from this is that there really is a building momentum, and there's, there's two streams. There's the somatic gene editing stream, so really looking at disease treatment and prevention, so looking at ways to treat cancer or to prevent HIV. And then we have the more germline gene editing, which is looking at ways to better understand miscarriage and infertility. And so this was a headline that came out last year. So there really is a boom in human gene editing um, as there are 20 CRISPR trials that are gearing up and China is really a leader in all of this and a, a key player in advancing our understanding of gene editing. So now, what are some of the overarching ethical, legal and social issues uh, surrounding CRISPR and gene editing? So first is really the safety and uncertainty of the technology. So we're, we're really thinking about minimizing the risk of harm and understanding um, the, the risks that are associated. Then there's also the notion of risks for future generations, which are often irrevocable and unforeseen. There's the potential for future misapplications of the technology, and there's also the inability to obtain consent from those who would be born following genetic modification. Next, there's also the notion of preserving human diversity and individuality. We have the idea of respect for reproductive freedom and, and choice. Then there's the notion of enhancement. So these are all the Gattaca-esque concerns, designer babies, superhuman, uh, superhuman, super athletes, and which all leads into the idea of social justice, so equitable access to the therapy, um, and the potential for new forms of inequality, discrimination, and social conflict. We also have the notion to protect the welfare of children born from the technology. And finally, there's the need for meaningful and substantial public engagement, as we'll see in a lot of the policy statements that have been put forward. So all of this set the stage for the comparative legal and policy analysis of six different gene editing technologies across a sample of 16 countries that um, our group conducted, and it was published in Science back in January of 2016. And so what you can see here is really that we're looking at a patchwork of regulatory landscapes. So for some technologies, such as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or human reproductive cloning, we see that there's a bit more global consensus either to permit or prohibit the technique. But when we look at human germline genetic modification, which is the map 
at the top um, left, we can see that it really is a patchwork with some countries being more permissive and others being much more restrictive. And something to keep in mind in all of this is that what we're really trying to do with our regulation and our laws is to regulate the risks and uncertainties and the unknowns that are attached. And with all of this, we also should consider, well, thresholds for acceptability. Should we consider setting thresholds based on the gravity of the disease, its treatability, or the risk of developing it? So for the sake of time, I've decided to just focus on international policy developments um, of 2015, as this was the year where they were really um, booming. And so some of the key points that arise from these are really that, well, we should allow human genome editing for research purposes, as long as it's justified and supported by ethical review and oversight, as this will allow us to gain a better understanding of the technologies and the safety and ethical concerns. There was also agreement that there should be a moratorium on the clinical applications of germline editing, as safety and ethical concerns still need to be addressed and understood. The National Institutes of Health in the US have stated that they will not provide funding for gene editing technologies in human embryos for research. And finally, a statement that sums up um, the, the international summit on gene editing that was held back in December of 2015 is really that it would be irresponsible to proceed with any clinical use of germline editing unless and until, one, the relevant safety and efficacy issues have been resolved, and two, there's broad societal consensus. So something to keep in mind, while this last statement was being made, um, the goal was really to slow down science and to give us a chance to reflect on whether, as a society, we really wanted to move forward with heritable genetic modifications. So since then, um, in December of 2016, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research have put forward a points to consider. Um, they do not take a clear position in this, but do reiterate the general consensus that germline modifications for clinical and reproductive purposes should be tabled for the time being. And the, the main goal of this points to consider was really to inform and guide future discussions on the topic. And then finally, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, or as I'll refer to them, the NAS, um, in February of this year, put forward a report on human genome editing. And what they recommend in this diagram, really quickly, is a set of overarching principles that should be used by any nation in governing human genome editing research or its applications. So they kind of put forward seven um, general principles to keep in mind. And so what does the NAS report recommend? Well, when it comes to basic laboratory research and somatic gene editing, editing for treatment and preventive purposes, they've deemed that this is valuable and well-regulated and it should proceed under existing oversight and regulatory norms. When it comes to germline genome editing, they give it a yellow light, which is a step forward um, from all of the other 2015 policy statements which really said we shouldn't even consider it. And they say that clinical research trials, only for compelling purposes such as treating and preventing serious diseases, should be permitted, if uh, provided that there is stringent oversight and that the uses are limited to specified criteria. So they have a list of very specific criteria that would need to be met in order for the clinical trial to move forward. Um, and then, finally, when it comes to human enhancement, they still deem that this should not be approved at the time, that public engagement and discussion on the topic should be actively promoted before we advance into that area, and that specific funding should be allotted to support this. So in my opinion, the NAS really is moving forward, and we can see some forward progress um, in terms of what they're putting forward. So I put this slide up because I thought it was an interesting um, comparison between what was emitted um, in December of 2015 and then the NAS statement in 2017, where we went from germline editing would be irresponsible. And so the moral line here was really between somatic gene editing versus germline gene editing. And we were trying to slow down science in order to carefully and conscientiously reflect on whether we should attempt hereditary genetic modifications. And now in 20, 2017, when we're saying, well, it could be permitted provided it meets specific criteria, we now see that there has been a shift and the moral line is now between um, therapeutic and preventative purposes of gene editing versus enhancement and no longer necessarily the somatic versus, uh, versus germline. And so the NAS has been criticized for opening the door to human gene editing, but the way they've perceived it is really as a way of removing the padlock pending possible new applications. So this allows them to remain flexible to the possibility that 
germline clinical trials, we will, we will get there shortly. So just to provide a graphic representation of human germline genetic modification with regards to regulation, laws, and policies. So the UK is really the most permissive when it comes to research purposes, and they have a licensing system in place. And well, as we can see, Canada is actually one of the most restrictive countries when it comes to germline um, editing. So in Canada, germline gene editing is regulated by the Assisted Human Reproduction Act, which was adopted in 2004. And so Section 51F states that no person shall knowingly alter the genome of a cell of a human being or in vitro embryo such that the alteration is capable of being transmitted to descendants. So they're, they're specifically targeting germline alterations. And anyone who contravenes to this is guilty of a criminal offense and liable to a fine up to $500,000 or up to 10 years of prison. So this is quite a harsh um, uh, offense. And what we need to note, though, is that this clause is in a bit of an inter interpretive gray area with regards to its scope. So does it include both research and clinic? Is it solely clinical applications? Um, this is something that really does need to be clarified. And furthermore, when it was first adopted, there was a provision stating that um, the Assisted Human Reproduction Act should be revised five years after its adoption, something that has not been done. So we deem that a revision is um, long overdue. So now, um, cognizant of this long uh, overdue need for a revision, uh, together with the Stem Cell Network of Canada, our centre organised and ran a workshop on human gene editing uh, back in August of 2016. And so we brought together 21 experts on science, ethics, law and policy, as well as government observers and end users to gain insights and to discuss the status of human gene editing in Canada and possible ways forward and ways to modify the assisted human Human Reproduction Act. For anyone who's interested, I've put up the reference of the, the recommendations that are stemming from this discussion, but I will be walking through the four key points. So the take-home messages, um, there are four. So the first one is the need for Canada to revisit its current laws and policies in order to consider different approaches and policy tools to address the promises and challenges of gene editing. So. It's been deemed that bans are not the most effective way to approach genome editing and that regulation would be much more feasible. Um, this would allow Canadians to potentially enjoy the benefits of scientific progress in its applications as per the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it would also allow Canadian researchers to remain engaged in the evolution and progress of the area of research. Secondly, we note the importance of promoting a scientifically sound and ethically informed policy debate. So we should be taking a principled approach to our policy making, and it should be one that's not driven by hype, but founded in evidence. Thirdly, we note the importance of scientific freedom as a core principle of liberal democracies. So science should not be limited by policy without compelling reasons. Regulation should not be overly prohibitive, but rather, when appropriate, it should remain nuanced, as flexible as possible, and sensitive to relevant distinctions. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, the importance of informing and engaging the public. So we want to encourage an inclusive approach to policy making and recognize a diversity of voices. Also, evidence-based policy should be based on an informed debate that incorporates societal and cultural values, as this will ensure a good fit with the broader Canadian and social context. So this workshop was one in a series of five. Um, so the second one that happened back in March was on mitochondrial replacement therapy. We've got another one on the existing and novel stem cell research technologies coming up at the end of the month. And then um, another on pre-implantation genetic diagnosis in August. And all of these will kind of come together to form a consensus statement which will present to Health Canada with the recommendations of how we see um, the revision and the amendments going to actually bring the Assisted Human Reproduction Act into 2017. And so I think the, the kind of take-home messages from my presentation are really that there is a convergence 
on an intention to advance with caution with regards to gene editing. Um, we've determined that while well, prohibitions are not the appropriate tool and regulation or oversight bodies would be a much more effective mechanism. And then there's this, all, there's this ongoing need for transparency and discussions. So we need to engage various stakeholders as this will inform ways forward and influence our policy making. So on that note, thank you for your attention. So I'll invite all of you to go out for a coffee break. Uh, we have cookies and brownies as well outside. Uh, there'll be SP members uh, waiting to collect your questions at the doors. Uh, we'll select them uh, when uh, we come back in 15 minutes.